and welcome to the latest episode of the Built Environment Marketing Show, hosted by me, Io Abbas, an award-winning marketing consultant. I run Abbas Marketing, which is a built environment marketing consultancy that works with leading firms in the industry to figure out their marketing strategy, content and campaigns. Today, I've got not one, but two very special guests, and they are Sarah Canning and Deanie Lee, the co-founders of marketing agency, The Property Marketing Strategists. In this episode, we talk about why data and research should be the foundation of your marketing, why we all need to get better at listening to young people and acting on that information, and why firms need a proper budget for research. We also touch on the fact that there's a missing gap in terms of leadership in marketing and how teams at the moment are very, very junior. Anyway, I'll stop talking now and let you get on with enjoying the show. Take care. Bye. Hi, Sarah and Dee Dee. Um, Thanks so much and welcome to the show. So my first question is, can you introduce yourself and the property marketing strategists? Do you want to go first, Sarah? Yeah. Hi, Ayo. Thanks so much for inviting us onto the Built Environment Marketing Show. We're very excited to be here. Um, I'm Sarah Canning. I'm one half of the property marketing strategists. Um, we are a small agency specialising in the in the private rented sector. Um, we've always worked in in property and education, um, and and really our focus is to establish marketing as a key function um, of property marketing. Um, and we work with clients um, on a consultancy basis, but we also do a lot of events and initiatives and research um, to elevate the role of marketing within the industry. And Dini, over to you. Hi, I'm Dini, and thank you so much for having us, AO. It's great to be here. And um, I'm the other half of the Property Marketing Strategist. I don't think I could say it much better than Sarah said, but just that really our passion is to make the sector better at what they're doing, delivering for customers, investors, and all the stakeholders in the business. So I'm going to I'm going to ask a follow up question. So how do you make the sector better? Who wants to go for that? <laughs> <laughs> no, because it's like you keep making marketing a key function and making the sector better are awesome ambitions, by the way, because it's so important, and I completely get why. But how? That's how it started. To be honest, that's how our business started. Is that we suspected that the sector don't ask their customers um, enough um, about the product and about marketing. So we, before we were even a business, we decided to do a survey to the sector to find out if, if our hunches were true. And, and that was correct. So once we had the data to say this is where the industry is, is failing and, and the, you know, the impact of not asking customers what they want is that we felt that there was a homogenization in the product and that therefore you know, the sector won't be able to fulfill their ambitions from a, from a, you know, a commercial and an investment point of view. So everything we do, really, we back up with data and, and research um, and we question and we challenge. And, you know, we, I guess because we're freelance, we are in a position where we're able to do that with our clients and with the sector in a way that you can't do as well if you're working in-house in a, you know, in a full-time marketing director role. And I guess that's a lot of what you're doing. It's actually you're challenging, aren't you? You're, and you're not afraid to challenge, isn't it? Because you're going to go and go, OK, you've based this on this. Why? And it's like, where's the data to back up why that's been done in that way, I guess, is it? Yeah. And I guess we are filling the gaps that the sector knows that they have, that they know that they want to do, but they often don't have the time or the resources or the inclination to ask the real questions. So... <laughs> I think we, you know, like everything that we do, we provide for free, you know, for the sector to kind of understand and be better. And a lot of the stuff that we do do, like the research we do, like the youth forum we do, is about, is things that we were frustrated that we couldn't do when we were in sector because we were running big marketing departments and yeah. we couldn't get the budget sign off, we couldn't get the resource, we couldn't. So it's just taking the things that we know that can help with the answers and, and giving them to sector in a way that they can digest and engage with. So I'm just going to take you back a step. So what sectors do you guys specialise in? Because I guess we haven't really covered that so that people understand. Because <laughs> you're different to my normal clients, um, normal people I, I speak to, because I'm more of a kind of business to business person, consultant, you know, work with architects and specifiers. But normally who you work with is slightly different. 
it's quite varied, to be honest. And again, that's the benefit of doing what we're doing. So our background um, is purpose-built student accommodation or PBSA. Um, but that has also covered kind of build to rent as well. So kind of the next stage of the private rented sector. But also we're dealing with young people as the end user, as the customer. And because of that, we've been privileged enough to work with some universities who actually have seen the benefit in our experience in university accommodation. And we've also worked in, in prop tech as well, um, really because of the work that we've done with the end user, with the Gen Z sector. Um, and it feels like we've become a little bit of the go to people to sanity check user experience, um, you know, the customer journey and user flow in a way that tech companies can't always visualize or can't always have the access to. Um, so, yeah, so it's really varied um, who we work with. And I think what we need to, I guess, ensure the industry understands is that whilst we predominantly work in student accommodation and Gen Z, they are the future house buyers. They are the future house renters. They are the future workforce. They are the future tech users. So we've really got to listen to what that generation is saying. And they're the generation um, that, to be honest, are quite often um, forgotten about. They're quite, you know, their views are quite often, you know, minimized. Um, for example, you know, at the moment, with regard to the cost of living, you know, yeah. there's any, you know, I, I can't think of a time when a, a, a member of parliament or anyone in government has been talking about what, how that impacts students, you know, and how, you know, Hugely, yeah. yeah, you know, there's some desperate situations going on about, but, you know, they've been forgotten about. And it's the same with the product of student accommodation, really. Um, and even within industry, we, you know, we actually cringe and we, we do call people out when we hear people referring to their customers as, as kids, you know, they're oh, not kids. They're, <laughs> yeah, that's so patronising. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, and it, and it negates the impact of the and the value <laughs> of their opinion. And they're paying a huge amount of rent. Um, oh my in, gosh! You know, yeah. you know, the average rent is just under for a student is just under eight thousand pound a year outside of London. So you know, you know, ignore their views at your peril because actually, you know, <laughs> they are voting with their feet and with their pounds. I, I will never forget, um, I, I went to university a long time ago, but in Hertfordshire, and I'll never forget that the, our, our halls of residence in our uni were so bad with students at that time, like how they treated their international students. Literally another another university poached a, a whole coach load of university students, international students and their fees, and they even sent a coach to collect them. So you can just imagine how much money that was on that bus. And that was because they weren't looking after them. And it's like, they're not kids. They're paying for this. <laughs> and they would have been paying way more fees than we would have done and their accommodation. So that coach was worth millions. <laughs> it was. It was, right? It was completely. I, I even I, I noticed that. I was like, that's a lot of money leaving this university <laughs> because they didn't yeah. look after them. So they didn't value them. Yeah, they don't. And I think the, the thing that I've learned out of the years that I've been working with young people is that they are far more switched on, far more dedicated, far more know about their rights and what is the right way to treat them than I think I was not when I was kind of in that generation. Yeah. Um, that, you know, you can't, you can't get anything past them. You can't kind of turn no. a blind eye to them because they know, they know what their rights are. They know what they want. They're dedicated to where they want to get to. And we as a society have a right to, to help them do that, not ignore them. And I think the other thing is they're not afraid to ask which I know annoy, annoys a lot of people. It's like, they're quite forward. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've done um, surveys and focus groups um, for our own research, but also for clients. Um, and we're never not surprised, you know, and it, and it just shows you how important that is because you can't take their views for granted. And most of the people, ourselves included, sadly, are not that generation where we're, we're you know, many, many years away. And, you know, it's quite funny because we get older, but our kind of audience stays the same. You know, if we're always dealing with 80 to 21 year olds generally, but but their views change. They might, you know, that might be the same generation, but we see their views changing year in, year yeah. out. Um, the demographic in this country changes a lot because of international students, because of um, different um, policies that are in place to encourage different types of people to go into higher education, but also into further education and apprenticeships. 
Um, you've got the current cost of living crisis. Um, yeah. you know, we see differences in people's views. And I mean, our our message to the sector is that you can't really classify your customer base as one. You know, you're not targeting this group. No, absolutely not. And 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 this is now very, very clear that, that students are saying we are not one homogenous group. They want to be targeted um, and segmented in relation to their interests and their and their views. So building one product for that age group and that demographic is, you know, is is a massive, massive mistake. Wow. That's amazing. So what would you kind of see as a kind of differences, I guess, when you're marketing to that group that, that people need to kind of, that clients in the sector need to understand? How can they kind of, I guess, segment that market? What do they need to do? Are there any particular things they should be looking at, Deanie? Uh, they need to understand their demographic in their building. You know, no city is the same, no building is the same, no university is the same, no residential community is the same. And I think... If you're not asking the questions of that community about what they want, what they like about their product, what they don't like about their product, what's frustrating them, then you're never going to improve that product or change that product or or be prepared for the future. And I think far too often, and, and probably more so in student accommodation, is that it, it, it's been really good for so long and there's demand there and you can build and people will arrive. But actually when you get a much better kind of educated audience, when you get a, an audience that kind of knows what they want and what they should be getting, then they're gonna, they're gonna vote with their feet. Um, and if you're not asking the questions now, when you've got a three to five year build project, you're gonna be way behind the curve further down that line. So I think it's just, you know, as Sarah said right at the beginning, it's all, it's all in the data. So it's understanding your data, understanding your trends, understanding how that demographic is shifting and speaking to them, asking with them, engaging with them and learning. You know, every day is a day to learn. And I think that's a key thing in driving product forward. We're seeing this start to leak into build to rent as well. You know, again, the market is incredibly buoyant at the moment. And, you know, developers are successfully filling their buildings um, on what's currently being developed. But those people's views will change and the market will become tougher as it gets more and more competitive. Um, you know, so for, for people to stay ahead of the curve and to stay competitive, they need to constantly be evolving and asking, um, you know, the future customers, not the customer. We always think it's much more interesting to ask people who didn't buy your product because the people who did buy your product are the people who a can afford it and who chose those facilities but you know i would be much more interested in asking the people who didn't buy that product why didn't they yeah. um and is there a better product for those people yeah or why you went elsewhere right because <laughs> you voted with your feet and they weren't you know they weren't at my door and I, I think you're absolutely right and but I guess that's the, those are the hard lessons and questions to ask right so I guess that's where working with someone like you they, at least you're external so it's not I guess you don't have to take it to heart as much right but it's also the resource you know we, we've worked within you know many for different property developers and operators and where does research sit it doesn't you know although we work in marketing it doesn't really feel like a traditional marketer's role. Most companies don't have a researcher's role. Is it the role of the investor? Is it the yeah. role of the developer? Is it operations? Um, and we we work with people who go, we really want to do this, but we don't have budget for it in our marketing budget. And we're like, well, why would it sit within a marketing, marketing budget? budget? That's yeah. not necessarily where, where it sits. It has to be collective to get the product right. And what often happens is that the marketeers are involved at a very, very late stage. And they quite often have the answers because they're watching stuff. They're listening to the customers. They're on social media. Yeah. They're seeing the inbox. But the development team and the acquisitions team and the investors don't necessarily know that. So as well as asking the customers, it's you know listening to the customers, but working collaboratively within uh, a, a de, you know property development or investment team to get the product right for the right people at the right time um so you know yes we do you know we are able to to you know to provide that service but we very much work in collaboration with the internal team quite often because they don't have the internal resource to yeah. for it to be or, or the you know the knowledge or the experience and yeah the worst thing that can happen with research is that you do it all and nobody listens and you don't yeah. act on it and we're very tenacious about that. 
So in some ways, is it something that research should actually sit at board level? Do you know what I mean? Like to actually have proper research to drive all aspects of your business in a way, because if you think about all the functional areas that you're talking about, they described earlier, that it actually impacts on from what your product is, how you sell it, you know, all of that kind of stuff. In some ways, it kind of needs to be elevated in a way, even though it's missed at the moment. Is that the case? I think it's it's understanding what your objective is, I think, and and driven from the business leaders is where that's going to happen. I think the issue far too often is that research is done to reaffirm what you're doing and to prove that you're performing and you're doing what you need to do. But actually, what is that telling you in terms of driving business forward? So, you know, and, and throughout my career, I've always focused, if we're going to go out to our customers you know, what, what other questions can I sneak in there? What else can I understand? What, you know, what do I want to know from them now that's going to make me make changes to my business going forward? And I think unless you've got, and if it's done by one department, you're always going to get one department focusing on what they want to listen and learn. If it's done by operations, yeah. they just want to prove that, you know, how they're performing. They're doing a great job. Well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If it's just operated by marketing, it's just going to be about how's my marketing functioning, how's whereas yeah. actually if it's taken into actually what's the business objectives, how does the business want to move into the future, then you can get a really decent piece of research that can drive the strands of the business and impact everyone in that department. So can you tell us about the kind of research, re, the recent research that you've done in, into Gen Z and, and how that how that came about and some of the kind of key findings that you found? What's to kick off with that one? It was uh, a kind of an extension of the work that we did initially to find out that the market aren't asking their customers what they want. And we decided that we would do it for the industry. Um, We're working with um, an amazing partner called UPP, which which are the largest on-campus university um, providers um, who've been incredibly supportive. And we have sponsors as well, which has enabled us to, to, to not only do it from a resource point of view but also have a great team of people that have been able to input into into it and what we wanted to find out is what does the future home look like according to to gen z what do they actually want and we we split it into into different um into different pillars as we call them and um, which is community affordability sustainability well-being technology and technology <laughs> It's <laughs> like, it's one, one. It's another one. It's another one. Great right yeah. at four. Um, I, I just love the way she came in. It's technology. Yes, it's <laughs> always one, and it's never the same one that I forget. Either. It's just a Um, I know there's five. There is. There is. There is. Um, and what that and, and it was a long survey. So we surveyed two and a half thousand young people. They were sixteen to eighteen year olds. They were current students and they were graduates. Um, yeah. We didn't want to assume that this is about students because there are many 16 to 18 year olds that haven't decided if they're going to university and don't understand what student accommodation is. So we yeah. wanted to make sure that we had the full breadth of, of the future of, of home. Um, it was a long survey. It was over 20 questions. It, it, uh, it, 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 I imagine it was quite time consuming for the participants. Um, and what that's given us is a big, big body of research that we we're cutting and analysing in different ways. Um, we've launched it into a series of webinars, blogs, podcasts. We've had quite a lot of press coverage about it as well. Yeah, I've seen um, you on the BBC. <laughs> yeah, Deanie, Deanie was there on the BBC. <laughs> um, and what's really interesting is that there's so many different ways to cut the data. Um, we've got quite a bit of demand at the moment to cut our data to differentiate international students and domestic students. And and we can can do that. And we had a really interesting query um, about do we have any data on young people who have been in care? Now, we we, we don't, but it was great to be challenged on, on yeah. that. And we're potentially working on another piece of research with with um, with that company to um, to find those questions out. So, yeah, we're, we're absolutely delighted with the response that we had. And some of the most of the answers were. Um, challenge what is being built in the sector which is yeah. great because that you know I guess the worst case scenario was is that all of the we respondents affirm, <laughs> yeah, affirm what's out there and we're like oh that's not very interesting yeah um, but actually that's that's not the case um, and as Deanie said I think what we wanted to do that was different is that our research our database is independent 
it doesn't it's not um from some you know a group of people who are living in a particular um you know operators buildings it's not a particular part of the country and also our data has been analyzed by data loft so we're confident that we've pulled the right um kind of meaningful answers out of what we've we've done to to benefit the industry and what we were able to do with all those different data sets was understand that journey for Gen Z through kind of their choices of accommodation and being able to look at kind of future students, students and graduates were able to understand kind of the reality going into that first move from home to kind of what your expectations were they met kind of when you go and come out as a graduate and that's quite powerful data in understanding that yes people are excited about this going in but actually what really matters when they're there and when they come out is something else entirely um, and that you the industry which wouldn't have had that data before. Hi, it's Io here and I just wanted to tell you a bit more about the show. The Built Environment Marketing Show was set up during lockdown one as a way to help firms do better marketing. It was very much about having the conversations that I have with my friends and showing what best practice really is. In terms of me, well, I'm actually a generalist marketeer, so I guess I know lots of things about marketing and how to put everything together. So I could be talking about, you know, PR or understanding what to do next strategy wise or figuring out how to get in front of the right audience or what messaging you should be using. Those are all things that I'm kind of really skilled in and understand how to do for my clients. I now work for myself and I set up my own consultancy at Bass Marketing in 2020. And I'm working with a range of engineering and architectural firms and even prop tech firms who really want to, I guess, talk the language of their clients and their audiences and do something a bit different in terms of their strategy and content. If what I do sounds of interest to you, do email me at io at abassmarketing.com and that's A-Y-O or head to my website, which is www.abassmarketing.com for more info. There's also a link in the show notes. Bye. Just stepping back a bit from your, your research. So in terms of research as a marketing tool, how can, I guess, firms that, are in the sector look to kind of, I guess, include that as part of their marketing mix? Are there any tips on getting started in research or what to do? I think it's just, again, it comes down to this, where do you want to go as a business? What questions do you have? How are you going to go get, get them? And I, and I talk to clients that we work with all the time and I'll talk to designers and people in marketing and I'll kind of always say to them, you've got a base of like your customers out there living in your buildings like you can't get much more personal and yeah. interactive than that and I'll always say to a designer that's working on a new campaign go and do a go, go out and walk around some student accommodation show them what you've got and talk to it talk to them about it and get some feedback so I think I think far too often people see it as a stumbling block of I need all this other stuff whereas actually it's just well what do I want to know what questions do I have and how yeah. do I find those people to, to talk to? And I think the, the clear thing, as I said, you've got to understand what you want to understand before you go off to do it, because otherwise you'll be going off in all different tangents and you <laughs> might not come back and get, <laughs> and get it comes the back to the, the messaging as well. So I think from a marketing point of view, you know, what's clear that's come out of our research is, you know, the absolute impact of the cost of living and how much focus that that is and how... I guess distracting it is for them at the moment. So, you know, I was at a conference speaking the other week and I kind of said to everybody, if you're not including the word, you know, bills included as a key message in your marketing campaign, you know, you should be, because that's what the students want to hear at the moment. That's what's yeah. on the lips of the young people. You know, a few years ago, it was all about, you know, Wi-Fi, and then everyone stopped talking about it because it was just a given. But actually in our research, it's still really important, particularly for those future students who quite frankly lived through hell during covid probably in their houses with terrible wi-fi so the one thing that they want to know is when they go into their student accommodation they're going to have great wi-fi and if you don't yeah. ask those questions i think it's really easy as people who are not the right demographic who do not live in that environment just to take these messages for granted so you have to you know you have to really put yourself in the shoes of the customer um and again, you know, we've got the benefits. We don't work within one particular organisation. But I know from experience that it's very easy from a marketing point of view to churn 
the same stuff out, you know, year in, year out. Um, yeah. And just because it worked one year, you know, in, particularly in student accommodation and, you know, also in the rest of the private rented sector, because there's quite a high turnover, it's a new audience all the time. You know, so you kind of think, oh, I'll just do the same thing and do the same thing. But that audience changes and what they want and what they're focused on. I mean, you know, the environment message, you know, sustainability, we know should be a bit more of a key driver in decision making. But it's currently not, you know, being quite frank yeah. about it, it is the cost of living that is the primary um, the primary message. So there will be a time and a place we're confident that environmental and sustainable messages are front and centre of customer communications. But it's not the time now, you know, and there are there yeah. are things that are, are more of a priority. I, and I guess that's a good point, isn't it? It's the timeliness. I always think in messaging, it's about that timeliness, isn't it? How do you look around and go, actually, this is what we need to be talking about right now. And it's like, it costs, you know, ultimately, if you can't afford to be in university, you can't afford to be there. And that's probably, that is going to top any issue at the moment for, for everybody, I guess, isn't it? And and having things like bills included, it will be, I know how how much I need to pay out each month. And that's that's the key thing, right? I guess it's just looking at those pressing issues. What does that mean for students and, and asking them? It's about, like marketing is about marketing a product and telling about products, but part of that role is educating them in what that product is and what their expectations are. And you can't do that unless you understand that the place they're in. And like Sarah says, if it is about, you know, it, it's not what our research isn't saying that young people don't care, Gen Z don't care about sustainability. They do care about it, but their view is that I, it's not me that should have to pay for it. Um, I still need to be able to afford my accommodation and that's going to be my driver um, for moving forward. And similarly, you know, the, the things around Wi-Fi and, and you know, one of the things that really struck us in our research was around that the future students were desperate for a printer. And it's kind of like, well, why, why, why do they want a <laughs> what are you printing? <laughs> Who knows? But then I think what what we've kind of from our focus groups and from the the, other, the subsequent work we've done, I think what it's about is what Sarah was saying about this kind of being stuck at home with your parents. You're all trying to print things, and yeah. actually there might just be an education piece, and actually you don't need to worry about a printer because you'll have ones at the university on site that you can just go and use a card, and it's just done and dusted, and it's really simple and easy. Yeah. Um, so it's it's just it, you know. It, it's understanding where there are and messing the way that you're solving their problems. And that might be with your product or that just might be with the information. And similarly, you know, the student accommodation comes in, in all sorts of shapes and sizes, not as many as Sarah and I would like, <laughs> which is what <laughs> we're trying to solve. But they do come, there is still different ranges and different affordabilities. And it's understanding kind of what is available in the market and, and educate them in that way so they can make the right choices. But also, I mean, we're working on some campaigns at the moment with clients mm -hmm. and the messaging for, for kind of people who are within the building who can rebook for the following year is a very different message to the people who have never even seen the building, who are new yeah. to it. The message for incoming applicant students who are currently, you know, 17-year-old A-level students is very different to a 25-year-old post-grad student coming from China. You know, you've got, you know, there shouldn't be one marketing message. And that, again, is understanding. And we the, the first thing we do with a client, and I'm sure you're the same, is kind of is delve into what they're currently doing. And to do that, we have to we, we call it a marketing audit. So we'll look at the demographic. Who's in the building now? Where did they come from? Where did they find the building? Um, what marketing tools did they use? What age are they? What countries did they come from? And then only then can you decide what what the mix is and who you're actually you know targeting. Um, and that's kind of that's at the very very basic level of a marketing department and what they should be doing when marketing to their audience. I was say, do people have that level of data or they don't? They do. A lot okay. of people, and again, we've done some research into this with marketeers, a lot of them don't know where it sits or who's responsible for it. And it might be that within an organisation, it's a financial analyst that has that. And the well, marketeers, they have, somewhere. they have it somewhere, but the marketeers aren't necessarily asking the right people the right questions. Yeah. It might be sat with um, the people who deal with bookings and it might not be sat with marketing. But how can a marketeer create a campaign if they don't know who they're creating a campaign for? Yeah, or who's booking or or where they're coming from because, yeah, because then actually you're not talking to the right people or understanding who they are. So, yeah, I guess it it does all boil down to targeting, just targeting and understanding them who they are, isn't it? I mean, it's 
I guess it's basic marketing, but but it's I know the obvious doesn't always happen. No. I think you know, in the industry, and you know, to be quite frank, why Dini and I have ended up where we are is a lot of the kind of I guess the private rented sector and, and probably you know residential sales maybe um, had Jump. a bit of a uh, I guess disbanded a lot of the kind of senior marketeers. So there are a lack of marketing directors. There's some fantastic junior marketeers out there. But what we found from our research is they're being managed by operations directors. And what that means is that they haven't got any marketing leadership. And without that, it kind of doesn't allow the junior marketeers to understand what is possible from marketing yeah. and to have some kind of leadership I mean, me and Deanie have always said we have pointy elbows and we always did with, you know, we're never in the street. We will work our way into those meetings, whether people like it or not. Um, They're banging you know, on that door. Knock, knock, knock. <laughs> and <laughs> like, de- development managers do not want us in those meetings, you know, but we will be there. But junior marketeers haven't got that confidence or that experience yeah. or that knowledge to say that sounds like an interesting meeting or you know oh you're I want to be there yeah, or you know you're thinking of building there but we've had some really negative feedback about that area you know yeah. so we you know I, that's the other thing is that marketers need to be given the tools and the authority and the responsibility and be given the confidence to be able to find all this out rather than just we don't want marketing departments to be implementers and to be silos you know, and that's what we're trying to do is is give people and, you know, we, we work really hard with our clients on developing their teams. This isn't about us coming in and storming across all of their in-house marketing teams. We want to work with them and provide that leadership that they may, you know, that they may not have in-house um, through, you know, through no fault of their own. But if they're not being managed and developed by marketeers, then they're not going to, you know, you know, we're 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 curious we're analyzers, yeah. we're, we're challenging um, and we're creative. And that should be the characteristic of, of a marketing team. And they should be encouraged to do all that. As I say, I think we're very clear that marketing can't impact stuff that they don't know about. And if they're not in the room, they don't know about it and therefore they can't impact it. And marketeers can have an impact across every department and across the business. And yeah. um, if you're keeping them hidden, then you're not getting the most out of them, basically. I- I think the thing you don't realise is like, even when you start off as a junior marketeer, the level of access you can sometimes get to directors and senior people. I know when I, you know, when I worked at Mace, for example, I remember people would just be like, oh, you know the CEO? It's like, yeah, he knows who I am. I work with him. I have regular conversations. I know what he likes. And it's like, but I guess people don't always realise that that's access you can have as a marketeer and should have. And it's just by being at that table and and being curious but also you're right as we all need support to bring people up to that level because I mean that's that's ideally what you want isn't it we want to be part of that organization and helping to drive it forward and and not being afraid to challenge we joke that the word that is used the most in kind of offices with the marketing team is the word just can you just send out that email (laughs) can you just do a social post can you just make that word document look pretty and oh (laughs) <laughs> I've heard it I know I know it just makes my yeah. blood boil yeah, like, it does <laughs> and, and you know, I was once given a packet of crayons uh, um, as a secret Santa present as a I joke in inverted commas I would have found out who did that and I would have thrown it <laughs> I, you know and it, it, it made me feel a little this. bit sick yeah. <laughs> but, but if if marketers aren't given the permission to elevate themselves within a company that is what people think about marketers yeah. I, I heard it at a conference the other week someone said um, almost word word for, for word and it was about sustainability well if you let marketers take charge they'll make it look pretty but <gasps> it won't have the depth no and, I mean <laughs> No, um, no, no. Your no, marketing like, seems to be going, that's greenwash. What do you mean by that? Can you explain yeah. that definition? That's Invite what me to that meeting. Yes. Yeah, I want to be involved in that because, you know, okay, maybe it will have a lack of depth if they're not involved in those conversations and don't understand where it's coming from. But sustainability is a, you know, is a great example of that. And we're, we're working through some projects at the moment. But, you know, how is a building built? Were the marketeers ever told? You know, because actually if the marketeers know how a building was built and that can ask the questions to pull out the key sustainability messages, then they can create a fantastic B2B communications campaign around that 
and convert that into some B2C messaging. If they don't know that, if they don't know what the supply chain is, if they don't know where things were produced, if they don't know what the materials were, um, if they don't know what the carbon footprint was, then they, they have they have nothing. And then there is a lack of depth. So they've got to be, you know, as Deanie said, invited to meetings in all levels, in all departments and be given the permission to do it. And it might be that it starts small. It might be a, can I just sit in that meeting and just observe with a notebook? And then I build up the confidence and I'll start, you know, and I'll start contributing. But as marketing directors, we were around the board table. We had access to those conversations. Yeah. If you, you don't learn have, so much, don't you, from that? Yeah, and it's Oakley. all those different departments. If you don't have a marketing director or you don't have a marketing director who's been given permission to sit around the board table, then those messages aren't being filtered down to the junior marketeers who are the ones who are creating the messages and the cons. You can't be the mouthpiece of an organisation without being at the centre of the organisation. And I think that's the key. I mean, everyone knows marketing is a mouthpiece. Marketing tells the world what your product does, but if they don't understand the detail of what's in your product or what you're doing, I mean, I think the frustration that we get that if you're not around that table is it's business could be so much brilliant stuff, but if your marketing team don't know about it, then it's not being told to the world. Yeah, so and that's it. It. exactly. You're not capitalising it. You're, you're no. not using it, you're not taking it and actually using it externally. And I think the amount of stuff as well, I mean, I always find like the amount of stuff that lives on like an internet, <laughs> why did no one tell me like, this is really good <laughs> it's like you just care about showing it to your peers but nobody outside of the organization it's just this resource of amazing stuff but um yeah no it, it, it's so funny but I think the whole thing about bringing on the next gen and and, and getting marketers to be I guess more skilled and more confident and and, and become those future leaders right because that's what we need we're going to take over the world um but, you know <laughs> I'm just going to say, Ayo, you know, we want junior marketeers to listen to your podcast and our podcast because they're going to learn that. But I think they feel that they need permission to educate themselves or take an hour out of their day to to upskill themselves and to listen to this content and to and to learn. You know, and yeah. I guess that's kind of why we came into this predominantly is because we saw that there was a gap and we want, like you said, the younger generation to to, to learn and develop their skills. And if they if they're not being given that support internally you know, then there's so many resources, you know, externally yeah. um, that they can use. And they, they're not all costly. You're absolutely right. And I think that's one of the reasons I did this podcast is I want people to understand how to do marketing better. And that's mainly for marketeers, but also for people in-house in businesses. Because I always think, actually, if you're a one-man band or a small business, there's a lot you can do to actually make your marketing better. So, yeah, and it's just talking about it in, in normal language because it's not cloaked in you know what is it what is it it's the magical you know mystical art which I don't think it is but um so in terms of trends for 2023 and as we are coming up to the end of the year it's like in November um is there anything particular in the kind of build to rent in that kind of sector that you think we kind of need to be thinking about so definitely cost of living is, is the main issue and how you tackle that but is there any other rising trends that we should be aware of we we try I guess we don't want to refer to them as 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 trends um, because it should be intrinsic to, to the buildings but you know there's a lot of work going on in the background with regard to sustainability and not greenwashing and them not being buzzwords you know yeah. so really really thinking about how buildings are constructed and the, the longevity um, you know of of the products and the life cycle it's not necessarily happening I'm not sure that it will see massive changes in 2023 but the work is going on in the background no. yeah um you know and that's and that's the main main thing really I think from a from a product point of view I think in the sector that we work in it's a bit like steering a massive ship it happens slowly <laughs> and the things that will be built next year in 2023 will be complete we're in planning three years ago yeah. And, you know, so it's, you know, the changes that we should be seeing next year, we won't see for another two, three years after that. That sounds really negative. but No, but, but that's a good point, actually. That, look, that I guess it's, that's the lead time, isn't it? It's the lead time for a building. And, you know, a lot of even when you look at major projects like, you know, Elizabeth Line, it was blooming design 20 years ago. So it's like, how do you future proof what you're building now for the, you know, and it's, it is that issue which is going across development, isn't it? It's like you're building for the future now so it's kind of that weird dichotomy yeah I think the other thing that we saw in our research that we think could be implemented a bit easier is is the whole thing around well-being 
And I think for so long, people have been focused on external factors. So events, you know, we see this particularly, you know, Build to Rent have the most amazing community events and student accommodation do as do as well. And yeah. actually the students and the graduates in our survey have said, they just want a good night's sleep. They want a great mattress. They want soundproofing. They want blackout blinds. You know, well, some of those, God, are so easy to implement, you know, and oh would gosh. make a massive difference to their residents' well-being. You know, stick a blackout blind in, um, you know, have some really great processes and policies around sound and put a good mattress in. And that could be done tomorrow, you know, and it could certainly be done next yeah. year. And then you've got a whole messaging around we've designed these rooms to be in the best way for your well-being. It's like yeah. that's your messaging, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. And everyone knows that everybody who's had a good night's sleep is far better able to deal with the challenges that come their way. It's not going to solve all of them, but it gives them a fighting <laughs> chance. <laughs> Fantastic. So, so I guess a lot of what you do is B to C, isn't it? So business to consumer. In a way, I'm a B2B marketer, so I've always kind of done the whole corporate selling to other corporates. Do you see any kind of big differences between the two? Who wants to say that one? I I mean, there are obviously very obvious differences, but ultimately, I think when we talk about B2C and B2B, um, we're all, they're all humans. Yeah, <laughs> You're talking to a human, whoever they are. So I think it's about understanding that customer and yes it is business to business but in that business is made up of people so um really in reality as long as you understand who you're talking to what problem you're solving for them and how you're going to talk to them the mechanism of getting there is the same it's just probably you're doing it on mass which is where you know maybe more segmentation might come in in, in b2c um, because you're talking to a, a larger subset of people. Um, but I, 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 you know, I, I've worked a lot in B2B in my career, and I think ultimately your mess, you know, as you just said, it's all about your messaging, and it's about the only way you get your messaging right is understanding who your customer is and what is going to be the thing that's going to influence them to know that they need what you're trying to sell. I think the only thing I, don't, I guess it's that overall the context of B2B is not understanding that kind of things take longer to develop and all of that kind of thing that you're actually working to but I think that's probably the only thing I'd overlay onto that but you're right humans human we're all people don't bore us to death um <laughs> always a good look okay so on to my final question so we've talked a lot about research so are there any kind of particular tools or things if people want to kind of do more research what how can I get started I think it's looking at, you know, who is the best person to, to do that and, and for businesses to have a budget for it. It costs money. And I think a lot of people, you know, you know yes, you can send out a survey um, to your, you know, to your customer base or your database. And in theory, that doesn't have to cost any money, but it costs time to put those questions together and really think them through. It takes time to segment the data and it certainly takes time to analyze the data and it takes time to work out what to do with that data and what messages and who, who it's for. So if a company doesn't have the people that are the right people to have the time and the resource to do it, and if you don't, you know, then you need to look externally to do that. We're not a research business um, and we're very keen to, to point that out. We certainly don't have, you know, years and years of university experience to, to say that, but we understand customers. But it's you know there are plenty of companies out there who will provide the right research solution for your particular um, part of the industry or your particular goals um you know and but you know budget is is key really you know nobody can can do it with without a budget and you know we were amazed you know we we've used an independent data set but we've had to to pay organizations for that data to make sure it is um a reputable data set and it's come you know it's the right demographic um because if you like we've been saying all along if you ask the people within your industry or the people who have already bought your product you're not going to get a full full range of answers um so yeah i think but it's 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 strategic you know the name is in in our in our business name the property marketing strategist it's about strategic you know is it what is it that you want to find out and work work backwards from that you, know, you can always do quick polls. That's research. You know, I've, I've done, you know, many in my career that just let's put something out on Facebook and ask people, do they prefer A or B? 
yeah. it's not scientific, but it gives you a, maybe An a glimmer idea. of, of something. Yeah. That's still still research, you know. Ask a, a customer service survey. That's still research. Um, but like I said, the, you know, the end result has got to be if you don't get the answers you expected, what are you going to do with those answers? And an organisation's got to invest the time and effort into committing to yeah. making those, you know, those changes. If you've spent the time and the effort on doing the research, then you've got to spend the time and the effort on working through those solutions. Fantastic. And on that note, I'm going to say thank you so much for coming on the show, Sarah and Dini. It's been awesome. And where can people find out more about you? The best place to find out about us is on our website, which is propertymarketingstrategist.co.uk. Um, and we have lots of resources on there for our research. We also have um, social media on LinkedIn and Instagram. And we also have a YouTube channel and a podcast. Um, yeah, <laughs> yes, for the podcast. So we're, we're the not, not that I'm biased or anything about <laughs> <in our> podcast. <laughs> It's like podcast, we need more podcasts. Anyway, uh, thank you so much. And yes, I will write all the kind of contact for you guys in, in the notes as well, in the show notes. So take care. Bye. Thanks, Bye. 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 Thanks so much for listening to the Built Environment Marketing Show. Don't forget to check out the show notes, which will have useful links and resources connected to this episode. You can find that on abassmarketing.com. And of course, if you like the show, please do share it with others on social as it helps more people to find us. See you soon.